In this video, I want to tell you the 10 things I absolutely hate about the Nikon Z6 after two years use. Whoa, 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 chill out. I actually do love the Nikon Z6. I've got two of them, one that's filming me at the moment, and this is my second one. I use them for time lapses, and I recently actually made a video about the 10 things I love about the Nikon Z6 still in 2020 after two years use. And if you want to watch this video, this is the link to the video. But right now, we're going to focus about the 10 things I absolutely hate about the Z6 because it's small firmware things that they could have improved or just never done at all that would have made this camera so much better if they were fixed. But let's split the 10 things. First four are going to be time-lapse specific related, 529 is going to be video related, and in number 10 we're just going to drop all the things that the camera lacks in 2020 that affect the photos, videos, and the use of time-lapse with the Nikon Z6. If it's the first video that you're watching on my channel, my name is Michael Thomas, I'm a London-based time-lapse architecture and travel photographer, and this channel is all about finding the best views in London or wherever I travel to while I also show you how to create time lapses that stand out at these locations, sell them on stock sites, as well as the gear that I use professionally to shoot time lapses or video or photos in my line of work. Point number one, time lapse time limits. I often shoot the time lapse in body that just creates a 4K file that I want to immediately do an edit of to process for the client rather than shooting raw because sometimes there just isn't a need for that. And the maximum time you can be shooting a 4K time lapse video is 7 hours and 59 minutes. And that's at an interval of six seconds. You can shoot at an interval of one second, but that's gonna be only for one hour and 29 minutes. And you can shoot at a longer interval, but your movie will be just shorter which basically is three minutes in 24p. So I'm shooting it always in 4K 30p because I can then translate the 30p onto a 24p timeline and that becomes three minutes and 45 seconds at least. But when you think about it, with the dual battery pack as well as the cable with the dummy battery that I can power the Z6 for how long I want, while for example with the dual battery pack switching and hot swapping batteries, the seven hour limit is just pointless. It should be unlimited and just keep creating a long time-lapse 4K video file. And it's not a file size limit. It's just weird that you can't shoot for longer. I'd rather set it for 24 hours to shoot at one minute interval and have a quick day to night, night to day transition. When I'm shooting in P mode time-lapse, which I made a free part tutorial um, about, and you can watch that. It's one of the links actually in the description of this video. So this eight hour limit for shooting 4K video is just a limit that Nikon should let go, increase it in a firmware update, but it's been two years and yeah, we got nothing. Point two is time-lapse flicker on native Z lenses compared to the F lenses. So basically F lenses with the FTZ adapter, you can shoot time-lapses up to 5.6, f-stop 5.6, anything below that, the aperture won't move during a time-lapse. That's not actually the case on native Z lenses. They literally always open and close, open and close, and that can cause a minimum small flicker that obviously can be deflickered in LR time-lapse, but it's just this extra step that if you're shooting a five, 10 minute time-lapse during daytime, for example, you don't want to deal with. So if they at least introduced that up to 5.6, the apertures wouldn't move, that would be amazing. But especially in any time-lapse mode. I know it needs to measure the exposure and there's a limit of the aperture that it can measure the exposure, but at least if the Z lenses had the same feature as F lenses that up to 5.6, anything below that, it just leaves the apertures open and measures the composition compensation, exposure compensation based on that, it would have made such a big difference. I am a little bit annoyed that I'm having to sometimes unscrew native Z lenses and there are no profiles to correct native Z lenses in Lightroom because native Z lenses get corrected in body. So yeah, it's just a pain. That's why I usually end up using the F mount lenses or just manual lenses when I don't have to change the aperture and I do not want any aperture flicker. 
Point number three is actually to do with the MB10 battery pack that can accommodate two batteries. And sometimes you would want to, for example, shoot a sunrise, but you don't want to wake up for a sunrise. So you use the feature, the intervalometer feature built in the camera that you say, you know, I'm going to bed at 11. I want the sunrise time lapse to start at 3 a.m. So delay it by four hours, start at 3 a.m. What ends up happening is in the four hours that the camera is only on delay, it's not doing anything. The monitor is off on the camera because when you start the time-lapse feature, even with the delay, you set everything up, the monitor then goes off. So in these four hours between 11 and three o'clock, I've noticed a whole battery actually dries up. So it ends up just having one battery from three o'clock, which then sometimes just finishes the time-lapse at say six or seven o'clock, depends on the amount of exposures that it needs. Well, if it had two batteries, it would just have the sun leave the frame up until say 10 o'clock. The two batteries would have just allowed for a six, seven hour shooting time-lapse from night to day. So it is a bit annoying that it drains the battery while it's in just this delay mode. Well, it's actually worth mentioning that this delay mode is only working in the intervalometer where you're shooting photos, RAW, or JPEG anyway, but you can't set a delay in the 4K movie mode. Just a little bit of a pain and added three plus issue uh, onto this list. Point number four, we are talking about the prices of the XQD uh, cards. They're ridiculously expensive. I've got two 64s, one 128 gigabytes, and that can accommodate, let's say, 2,000 raw photos that are uncompressed because I want to keep the quality best when I'm shooting time lapses with um, raw images. Ignore the fact that it hasn't got a second card slot. While having these cameras for two years, not one file ever corrupted on me. So I feel pretty confident that it won't happen. I don't know, has it happened to anyone? But just, yeah, it didn't happen to me. But just the sheer cost of buying a 256 or a 512 is insane. So for time lapses, this is just, yeah, one small stumbling block that actually ends up costing you quite a lot. Let's move on to video related things that I hate about the Z6 with point number five and start with the IBIS stabilization. I usually have it on on. Uh, when you want to take a video of one frame without moving the camera, it works brilliantly. But if you want to start panning or tilting the camera up and down, it actually wants to hold that frame and it does that jerky movement. I've tried putting it in sport mode and I haven't really found that it's actually any better. When panning, it actually wants to hold on to a subject and it just has that jerky motion. It's not as much visible on a wide angle, but the longer you go and you even set uh, a manual lens to stabilize at that focal length in the menus, because you can do that, it still ends up being quite jerky. And there's also the electronic stabilization that ends up just being even worse. I've tried to vlog with it, added it on top of the IBIS stabilization, and it ends up looking absolutely horrible. Do not even turn on the electronic stabilization. It gets your footage worse than it would be unstabilized at all, even without IBIS. So for filming static subjects as if taking photos, the IBIS works great, but in video, when you're actually panning or you're moving, it, I just don't like it. I've seen other cameras perform way better than this. It seems like the IBIS is specifically optimized for taking photos, for taking videos, to avoid your handshake, but actually not moving the camera. It's a bit of a pain actually, you know, got used to it and deal with it. But I think this is the most hated out of all the video points of this camera. Point number six. Say you want to automate the video transitions between you being in a dark environment, going outside to the bright environment. So you want to shoot in aperture priority. You want the f-stop to stay the same. For example, you want to vlog with the background being blurred out, but you want the shutter to change as you go outside and the ISO to drop or increase depending on your conditions. So yeah, there is auto ISO feature uh, that you can set, but you cannot set the minimum shutter speed to remain at 1 50th. So if you're shooting 24, 25, it will go down to 1 25th 
and then start increasing the ISO. You cannot just say, don't go below 150. If you're shooting 4K, for example, 30p, you would want to say double that, so don't go below 160. No, it will actually go down to 130 and then start increasing the ISO. So you sometimes may end up just slightly in a darker location, it would go to the 125th or 130th and start increasing your ISO. It's just, you should be able to set it just like how you set it in photos mode, where there is set your desired minimum shutter speed before ISO kicks in. That element of the menu is just missing in video mode. And it is quite crucial because the motion in video, which is matching the number of frames per second, is just a little bit too much. We are used to the cinema kind of a 180 degree rule, so basically doubling your frame rate. And this camera in the aperture priority mode, when you shoot video, just cannot do that. It will go down to your frame rate and then start increasing ISO. I don't like it, don't use it. I end up using everything in manual. Point number seven is what Nikon sold us with the promise of this camera being able to do, which is N-Log 10-bit 4-2-2 modes being recorded into the Ninja V monitor. So that got released and then for a year, the LUTs, the specific N-Log LUTs for your editing software didn't get released. So this delay of one year was a bit of a pain. And then later on next year, we received finally the ProRes RAW feature. And I got this update as one of the first people in the UK, end of December, just before Christmas last year. At first, we were only able to edit ProRes RAW in Final Cut Pro. So I found out that the actual best settings for RAW to LUT conversions and LUT being applied to that footage to look good was actually a Canon C-Log2 uh, gamut version or something like that. And that gave us the most natural most likely what it should look like, colors and look. And it's end of September 2020 that I'm filming this and we've still not had any support files from Nikon to convert the RAW to log and then log to LUT in Final Cut Pro. And just as I wanted to show these Canon conversions for Nikon ProRes RAW, I updated to the latest FCPX 10.4.10 and now we seem to have finally Nikon conversions. Point number eight, and we're back to shooting with N-Log. And there's this huge issue of flickering with N-Log at certain ISOs. So I've done some testing and it only looks like ISOs between 1600 and 3200, you can actually use and they are fine. N-Log starts at 800, but 800, 1000, 1250 are just flickering. And there was multiple firmware updates to the Z6 as well as to the Ninja V and still none have actually sorted it. So I got no idea. And it seems like quite a lot of people online are vocal about how much it flickers. For example, terrible flicker, absolutely unusable is at 1250, 5000, 16,000, 20,000, 25,000. I wouldn't recommend you shooting at these high ISOs because it will be noisy, but just they are unusable. It's quite bad actually at 800, 1000, 4000, uh, huge noise issue that seems to be cleaned up by 6400, but they are all still flicker, not as bad as the previous ones. So to wrap it all up, if you're shooting N-Log with the Z6 into the Ninja V, only shoot 1600, 2000, 2500 and 3200. These are the only ISO levels that you won't get flickering. So it is a bit annoying that we waited so long first to get the N-Log, then to get the LUTs for it. And now a year later, we're getting flickering at all these ISOs. Pretty annoying if you ask me. In point nine, we are back to ProRes RAW. And it is a bit disappointing that quite a lot of filmmakers and people who know exactly the specs in and out say that the ProRes RAW is pixel bent and it isn't as great quality as other cameras that now got the ProRes RAW feature enabled. I've been reading that beta testers of the latest Premiere version, the 14.5, that haven't been released to the public just yet, just beta testers, there is a ProRes RAW feature that you can edit it and the different cameras are allowing different features in RAW to directly be changed on the master clip. And unfortunately, everyone's saying that the footage shot on the Z6 in ProRes RAW, you're only able to change the exposure, while on other cameras, the RAW functionality, you can actually change exposure, ISO, white balance, and apparently Z6 ProRes RAW 
only enables you to change exposure. Pretty limiting if you ask me, however, all the footage that I shot in ProRes RAW and edited in Final Cut, I've actually noticed that anything changing highlights, shadows, exposure, white balance didn't really affect the image, it wasn't really destroying the image, so that functionality, the RAW functionality, seems to be there, but more and more websites and blogs that review the ProRes RAW features added in the cameras say that Nikon has the least amount that you can actually change the RAW being just exposure, while other cameras, for example, have exposure and ISO, while others have exposure, ISO, white balance, everything. So it is a bit annoying, but yeah, it's just one of these things, I guess. And as promised, now moving on to point number 10, all the things that this camera lacks just will be wrapped in one point, starting with flip screen. I would have loved this camera to have a flip screen, just a flip out screen would have helped any vlogging scenario and position this camera as a good camera for vloggers because the face tracking is amazing. It could really have worked, but with that, and you know, it's just not great. I'm using the UU screen um, that I made a video about and it comes in handy, but, but just a flip out screen would have made such a difference. USB powering rather than just charging the camera when the camera is off. Oh my God, how much I would actually love to have that feature for long-term time lapses. Maybe the Z6S, the Z7S, as rumored, will have it just because the Z5 has it now. Second card slot would have prevented the whole internet of bashing this camera that it's not for professional use. As I mentioned, it never has failed me. I had never had a corrupt file on it, but for time lapses, I could put two 64 slightly reasonably priced cards and have a longer time lapse. Another feature that kind of bugs me is that when you're shooting slow-mo uh, on the Z6, you can only shoot it in the full frame mode. On the Z7, you can only shoot it in DX mode. I believe it might be a little bit of a cripple hammer on the Nikon side because there are cameras, other cameras, full frame, apparently based on similar kind of sensors that can do slow motion up to 120 frames per second in 1080p in both full frame and crop mode. Any mirrorless user will tell you how they hate removing dust specks from their images and it's especially annoying when shooting time lapses. So I just wish that when changing lenses there would have been a mechanical shutter that would close and hide the sensor so no dust specks would fall on it. And lastly, it seems like everyone who owns a Z6 is saying that the rubber grip is just peeling off. A professional body camera after two years should not have this issue. There's many other Nikon cameras that don't have this issue. So the materials they used, factory or whatever, that have this issue around here is, uh, yeah, just a little bit of a flaw. And that's it. If some of these things are really a complete stumbling block from you why you shouldn't get the Z6, then there you go. You know him now. However, as I mentioned to you before, I do have two Z6s that I absolutely love and use them and find them brilliant when it comes to shooting time lapses and videos. I just had to learn to overcome some of these things with features or workarounds or just avoid shooting in certain ways. Otherwise, I believe the Z6 offers the best value for money when it comes to entry-level sort of full-frame cameras. And in my personal opinion, it is actually the best camera for shooting time lapses. It's got really good video features for even 2020. And for photos, most full-frame cameras actually perform very similar when it comes to photos. Some people say that Nikon colors are much better. I won't disagree, I like them too, but they're not features that make this camera so much better. For me, it's the time-lapse features, the video features, and actually it's pricing. If you can get a used Z6 on eBay for something around 12 to 1300, I think it is a steal of a price. Thanks a lot for watching. Hopefully you found it useful. My name is Michael Thomas. You can follow me on Instagram at London Viewpoints and please subscribe, like and comment on this video if you found any more things that you hate your Z6 about or even tell me all the things you love about your Z6 or Z7. Oh, and lastly, I'm wondering how are you finding this vlog that I've set up on a motion slider that's in a bounce repeat mode. I'm kind of testing this out. I wondered if it's actually is annoying that the background is changing while I'm explaining you something, or do you find it actually being pretty cool? I wanted to at least give it a try once, and this was the try. Anyway, enough rambling. See you later, guys.